Hi, this is Mickey Fisher, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. I want to welcome new primary sponsor, the Blue Cat Screenplay Competition. Blue Cat is now open to submissions for the 2023 competition. The Blue Cat Screenplay Competition has been discovering and developing new storytellers for over 25 years to help new writers get a foothold in the industry. When you submit to Blue Cat, you're guaranteed a thorough read of your script with a written analysis of your submission at no extra fee. Blue Cat believes in supporting writers with more than just an opportunity at the cash prizes, but with feedback to guide each entrant to grow and develop. Blue Cat winners and finalists often make valuable connections in the industry, which help them begin professional careers. In addition, the five cash prizes total $18,500 this year. Send in your feature screenplay, TV pilot, or short film script when you're ready. The competition's deadline is October 30th, but if you miss it, you can still catch the late deadline on December 11th. My name's Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode 137 for December 6th, 2022. Well, this is actually going to be our last episode of the year, so I do want to wish everybody happy holidays, whether you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or anything else. Um, I just want to wish you a, a wonderful time with your family and friends. I do have just a couple of housekeeping announcements. One is regarding um, our schedule. Like I said, this will be the last of the year. Um, there will be uh, at least a couple in the first couple of months of 2023. One is with the Benson sisters, Julia and Shauna Benson. Really excited about that one. If you want to send in any questions for them, you can. Um, and then uh, there will be sort of sporadic releases throughout 2023, and that's because I'm going to be traveling a lot uh, for work during that year. Um, you may have seen, if you've watched previous episodes of the podcast, that I own a company that does driving plates for television and film, and I'm going to be literally shooting all over North America, uh, over 100 cities in the summer. And uh, that's actually one of the reasons I wanted to mention that, because a number of us do work on television series, independent films, feature films, and if you have any need of driving plates, it's very helpful if you submit the requests before we shoot. Say, for instance, we, uh, from time to time, we'll get a request like, hey, do you have this Bronx bridge um, in your driving plates? And if, if we get that request before we go to the Bronx, we can shoot that bridge. If we get the, re uh, the request afterwards, we may not have. So just please keep that in your mind. Um, if you have a chance to uh, ask people on the show that you're on, or if you know anybody who might be in a position to, uh, to need these, we can shoot not only driving plates, but also uh, cycling point of view footage. We could do general B-roll footage, and we will already have the film permits and, and, and all that stuff. So just want to put that out there. It's still a few months away, but uh, I would really appreciate it if you could keep that in mind. But today, um, we have a really exciting interview. We're going to roll with that right now. You created the series Excent and also Reverie and developed Mars for National Geographic. Welcome, Mickey Fisher. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it, you know, I, I'm just fascinated by your story. Um, and, uh, and I think part of the reason I'm so fascinated by your story is that we hear this conventional wisdom. Um, I mean, I've, this is episode 137, and I've talked to a lot of different writers, and everybody says it's, you, you don't get good until your 10th script, and you can't expect that your pilot is going to get made, um, and yet... There are the lightning strikes that happen. We were at a Severance panel at uh, Comic Con this year, and Severance was uh, a case where uh, the script was up on blacklist, and it got made into Severance. And you had a very similar situation happen, um, and I can't wait to talk about that. Uh, it, it just the teaser is that you got a call from Steven Spielberg on your 40th birthday, that changed a lot of things. And we will get there, but first I want to find out how you got to that point. Uh, you grew up in Ohio. Um, how did that lead to acting and filmmaking and all the other things that you did? Yeah, I, I grew up in Ohio. I was like uh, a kid who was right in the sweet spot for all those 80s Amblin movies and things like mm -hmm. that and for Star Wars. And 
um, for all those, all the kind of like great early uh, nerd stuff of the late Mm -hmm. 70s, early 80s. Like I was totally into all that stuff. I always tell people like my first memory as a human being was going to see Star Wars in the movie theater. Um, And I was the right age for like, you know, when Empire came out and I had all the, you know, glasses from Burger King and the free promotional Mm -hmm. posters. And like I would go with all my friends, my parents would take us and, um, you know, something like E.T. I saw. Every every weekend, the whole summer, it was at the movie theater across the river from us in Asheville, wow. Kentucky. And so, I definitely grew up loving movies and television. And I, you know, I actually played three sports year round when uh, when I was in elementary school. I played football, basketball, baseball, which are basically like the three sports at that time in Ironton, Ohio. Hmm. And when I got into fifth grade, I did my first musical, and then the sixth grade, I did my first community show. And I never played sports again. Like I never looked back. I just started doing theater. Hmm. Went to college for theater to uh, the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music for musical theater. Uh, that was my major there, and I thought really that I want to be on Broadway. Like I thought that mm. was kind of like my that was my dream at the time. And then while I was at school, I started seeing independent movies and started like just it was it was very much that time of like Reservoir Dogs and uh, Brothers McMullen and Gas Food and Lodging, mm-hmm. El Mariachi, like all these like great indie movies were coming out, this big explosion of indie movies. Yeah. And, and then the other thing that really happened at the time was my teachers were saying like, you're a character actor. You're probably not really going to work till you're in your forties. And <laughs> oh. I was already playing like a lot of old men roles and things like that in the shows at school. And it really was like, I don't want to wait that long. And so mm. I started writing stuff for myself to perform. I started writing monologues for myself, which led to writing monologues for other people. And our senior year, we did this big senior showcase where we took it to New York, did it for a bunch of agents. I ended up writing probably 90% of the dialogue in that. A lot Mm -hmm. of it was like a, um, there's a big section that took place during the Vietnam War and there were a lot of like stories and monologues and things. And I just was really hooked. By the time I left school, I was really hooked on being a writer Mm -hmm. as much as I was being an actor. And then gradually over the years, discovered that I was a much better writer than I was an actor and that I... Also, was much more disciplined about it too. Like I, you know, I had a lot of friends who were on Broadway and who were, you know, they would go to the practice rooms and they were up auditioning at 5 a.m. and they were really working material and constantly adding songs to their book. And I just really couldn't do that. I didn't couldn't motivate myself to do that. Mm-hmm. But I could sit and write for hours and hours and hours at a time. And so I think by the time like my early you know 20s, I realized like this is really what I want to do. I want to tell stories and I want to mm-hmm. be. Uh, I want to be a writer. And so, yeah, that led to making independent films and all that stuff. And, and, and eventually to me moving out here in 2011 to try to break into the film and TV out here in, in Los Angeles. Very cool. It, so um, let's, let's not go so fast through, through that time. Um, you did make a couple <laughs> of features. Um, tell me about that, that process and the things that you learned through doing that. Yeah, that, that started my, I'd say my mid twenties because I'd been writing for a while and I'd been writing a bunch of features and, you know, it's one of the situations where you're you're writing a lot of stuff, and I was sending it out to sending query letters. I was sending full length plays out to theaters for submissions. Anybody that took like open submissions, mm-hmm. and nothing was getting picked up. And so I realized, like, if I wanted to do this, if I if I wanted to have these things produced, like I was probably going to have to produce them myself. And mm-hmm. so by I think my late twenties, I had read Robert Rodriguez's book Rebel Without a Crew, mm-hmm. and I had written this script that was. Uh, a drama set in my small town in Ironton, Ohio, about two brothers who enter a boxing contest. And I had mm-hmm. just written it right around the same time I was reading this book. And I had a friend of mine from school named Jonathan Clark. And he um, had been, he was a couple years older than me. And he was a great actor. And he was living in Chicago. And I went to visit him at the time. And I gave him this script to read because I had written it. I was like, oh, if I ever got to make this movie, he'd be like a great the great lead for it. Mm-hmm. And while he was reading that script while I'm in Chicago, I'm reading The Rebel Without a Crew book. And by the end of the week, I was like, we should just make this movie. Like, let's just make, you know, we can make it in my hometown. We can borrow whatever we need. Mm-hmm. We can raise the money from friends and family. And we'll just make the movie and just, we'll just learn from it. And, he, and he'd been going through this thing where he really wanted to make his own acting reel. Mm-hmm. And who's going to pay for that? So he's like, well, I'll put some money in and we'll just start it. So that's really what we did. And it's, I mean, it's, it took me like three years to make the whole movie. Like all of us, mm-hmm. I say me, but like all of us, because it was basically like, we spent some time shooting it. We shot it in my hometown using all the stuff that we had at my, like our disposal. We shot it on film because I really mm-hmm. felt like oh, wow. it was in the early days when like the the, the 24 
um, frame video thing. Like that wasn't really like a, a, a real option yet. And mm-hmm. so we, I wanted to shoot it on film because it felt like, you know, the town is very blue collar. It's very like I wanted that to have that sort of atmosphere and to feel sort of gritty and grounded. And uh, it just seemed like film was the only way really to do that. So we shot mm-hmm. on mostly 16. We shot on some 35. And so it was really like this process of learning from the ground up how to make an independent film, raising the money, shooting it, very small guerrilla style, just running and gunning with cameras mm-hmm. in the streets and hanging out of cars and all the dangerous stuff you're not supposed to do. <laughs> and then we raised enough money to shoot it, but then there were all these other costs along the way, like processing and shipping and all these kind of crazy things. And so, uh, and then I, and then the editing of it, like I had, I had this great friend named Tony Teal who lived in Indiana mm-hmm. and I, I was working in a theater. I was doing a production of music band, I think at the time. And I said, Hey, I'm working, getting ready to shoot this movie. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I want to edit it, but I don't really know how to start. And he was like, why don't I edit it for you? Why don't you do it up here in Indiana? Cause he was a filmmaker as well. And mm-hmm. he had just built the system. And so for like a year, I would just go to Indiana whenever I could and sit with him and he would edit and then I would show up and we would make notes. And then, uh, so it was a very long process. So the thing mm-hmm. that I learned from doing it, the way it really affected my writing was there was a lot of stuff we just started cutting along the way. I thought I realized mm-hmm. I just over it. You know, scenes of people getting out of cars and coming into houses and putting down keys and hanging up the jacket. It's like all the stuff that you write, it's like, and ended up being very episodic in a way mm-hmm. too, very sort of elliptical where just beats would kind of come and go. And, um, and, and you know, the whole sort of screenwriting thing of like coming in late and getting out early, I wasn't really doing that as a writer until I mm-hmm. actually had to sit there and watch it. Like, oh, God, we spent all this time shooting this stuff. And now I'm watching it with an audience. And it's so boring. And we got, like, we got to start cutting. So it really changed my writing from then on, too. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, mostly just, like, learned about myself along the way. But, I mean, I think the biggest thing was really seeing it through, learning so much, learning to – uh, deal with adversity and, 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 and challenges and running out of money or locations falling through or people not showing up to, 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 to be in your movies and things like that. It really teaches you how to just roll with the flow. But mm. the other big thing along that period of time, they feel like the skills that, that ultimately I was able to bring when I finally broke in at the end of the day, it's about having a vision for, for your piece, for your movie, for your television show and learning to articulate that and communicate that vision to the artists and the crafts people who have to go out and make it. And so I think mm. that all of that was um, a really just like jumping in the deep water training ground to 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 start to do that for myself. Well, you know, that that's that's um, actually not a small thing um, because you, you think about how many people are just writing in a vacuum. And they never have, a, have the chance to see um, their script come to life, never ha- never get to hear actors read their lines. And, uh, and actually... Uh, within this streaming world, it's not even guaranteed that that staff writers will get to go to set and and see that part of the process. So, I mean, I could I can see it being a very valuable thing, and perhaps maybe this is just a, a theory, but um, maybe that led to um, you you building that into your pilot, and maybe a, a little bit of a key to how you were able to get a pilot made. Um, rather than having to go through the the process everybody else does with just writing to get in a room to get on staff and that kind of thing yeah i always think that like the way that i got in it was of this long 20-year journey that there is there is a very uh typical path coming out of film school and you work on a set and you're a pa and you work your way up in the rooms and um and that's still a very viable path i think for a lot of people and i took a really long circuitous route the other way, you know, out into the cosmos and back. But what I learned, so I spent a lot of time, was still still taking jobs as an actor in 2010. I think I did my last musical. And so I had that experience years and years and years of being on stage, saying dialogue out loud, mm. being around actors. I would write things and I would pull friends together and we would order pizza and they would read my scenes. You know, if I was in a show, like I would, I would corral a bunch of people together and read my latest draft of whatever it was. And so I really got a chance to hear, not only to like have the experience of being on stage and knowing what it feels like to deliver a great line, deliver a great speech, um, but then also being surrounded by actors and, and Mm. knowing what those things feel like coming out of their mouths. And I think that gave me a real advantage by the time I finally broke in and writing dialogue and, um, and, and, and becoming proficient at that. And yeah, I just think there were a ton of skills from those days that, that ultimately ended up translating. Like I did a ton of kids theater, worked, taught kids a lot, 
And then one of the first things that I had to do when we were shooting Extant, when we started making it, was we went through a process of auditioning one of the main roles, which is this little kid mm-hmm. who was playing the the lead robot in the in the in the series. And so I was in all those sessions, and then there was a, there was one session where it was a callback where the showrunner couldn't make it. And so I was the only person there, and they're like, do you want to give them some direction? And I was like, sure. And so I was able to jump in and work with these kids, which is something that was totally comfortable to me because mm-hmm. I had been doing it for 20 years. And so so I think a lot of those skills just, just seamlessly translated. Um, and then, of course, there's like 70% that's totally new and foreign that, that <laughs> had no idea what I was doing and had to learn. Yeah, yeah, very cool. So, so you came to LA. Had you um, had you already written a pilot before coming to LA, or or did you land in LA and then start experimenting writing? What uh, what was that like? I don't think I had written a real pilot yet by the time I moved here. I think that when I first moved here in 2011, it was really with that goal of trying to break in because I think I realized that the days of selling like a big feature spec. Were, it seemed like they were over and it mm. seemed like that was just harder and harder thing to do. Um, but I realized at the time that there were all the, you know, the television shows had writer's rooms and, and it was really a few years into the like learning about showrunners and knowing what those people are and what they do. And so it felt like getting onto a staff of a television show, one, it seemed like there'd be a lot more opportunities for that because mm. every show has six, eight, 10 writers. You know, if it's a comedy, maybe it's got even more. So maybe there's more of an opportunity there, but, um, but to do that, I had to teach myself to write television because I just hadn't done. Mm-hmm. I written a ton of plays, a ton of features. But, um, when I moved out here, I, 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 I told this story before to writers, but it really is like, I just sat down with a notebook and a pen and a remote mm-hmm. control and just started watching episodes of shows. Not even like I was, I was always reading scripts and reading pilots and things too, but mm-hmm. like watching it with a remote control, really seeing like here's the finished thing that ended up on television and almost breaking it down like an engine. Like this show mm-hmm. had this many acts. Each act had about this many scenes and they were about this length long. And uh, and that really paid off. I remember when, one of my first meetings for Extant with a production company and one of the producers was holding it. He was like, you know, it's even the perfect length. He's like, it's kind of amazing. It's like the perfect weight, you know, like that. That this was your first real pilot. And, uh, and so it, was, it was not for lack of experimentation. Yeah, well, I know um, some of the some of the best writers in the business learned that way. I think of um, Blake Snyder, uh, writer of Save the Cat, and that's that's he he did that with audio cassettes, but um, just with a stopwatch and timing scenes out and, and that kind of thing. Oh, I did that it, too. Yeah, the audio cassettes. I mean, I, I I remember very distinctly in high school, even before I ever knew who David Mamet was, that I loved the Untouchables movie mm. so much that I held up a cassette recorder to the television and recorded the entire movie of the untouchables on cassette wow. you know, backwards and forwards, probably on two cassettes so that I could drive around in my car and listen to the dialogue. And this was before I ever realized I really wanted to be a writer, but it's mm. one of those things where you look back and you're like, Oh, that's probably like <laughs> I mean, a big <laughs> clue. <laughs> yeah. It was a big clue of why I ended up where I did. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So, so you, you wrote the script for extant and submitted it to a contest that was a tracking b tv pilot contest was that the only contest you entered with that pilot yes yeah mm-hmm. there was a time i was entering a bunch of stuff around that period of time because i was living in orange county with my girlfriend we moved out here in early in mid 2011 she started going to grad school at cal state fullerton and so we were living in santa Ana, and um, i knew a couple people who were living up here so i would send them scripts and things I didn't really know a ton of people, and really I felt like one. there were only a couple of ways that I could get my stuff seen mm-hmm. to continue to write a bunch of query emails and letters, and, and, and I had been doing that, and none of that was working. And then I just started trying everything. I put scripts up on the Blacklist website. I entered a feature contest for the writer's store. They ended up winning about mm-hmm. a week before Exnet happened. Wow. Um, and then I entered this TV pilot contest when I placed second and that, and, and that's ultimately what led to like my manager and my agents and then getting to Amblin. And so I was just kind of trying everything. Like I was, mm-hmm. I had been writing a bunch of stuff and very much, but that specific script of, um, excellent, the pilot, I'd actually written it the year before in 2012, maybe like mid 2012. And I finished it and I was like, I think this is the best thing I've ever written. Like, I think this is really cool. It's exactly the kind of thing I would watch all that stuff mm-hmm. that, that you're supposed to be doing. And then this movie Prometheus came out the the alien sequel yeah and 
it had this whole sequence in it where there's like you know, immaculate conception in space, which is like a big core part of my pilot. And so I thought, well, I'll never sell it now. Like it's totally dead. <laughs> and I just put it on the shelf and I was like, it'll be a good riding sample. And then the following winter entered it into that contest and, um, and it had a pretty, uh, hooky log line about, you know, this mm. astronaut going to space and coming home and discovering that she's pregnant. And, um, yeah. And so I ended up just kind of like, it, it, that's the thing that opened all the doors. And I feel like it mm. validated all the things I had always believed, two of the things I'd always believed, which is if you had that right script, the thing that people were looking for, that it will open all those doors for you. Um, but then two, like it still just takes a little bit of luck. Like you mm. can do everything right. You can have a great script. You can have a great log line. Um, but if one person along the way is like, this really isn't for me, then you're on a totally different path. I mean, I could be, I may not be sitting here talking to you today if that was the case. Hmm. I uh, I read an interview that you uh, had given around the time that uh, that extent was was sold, and um, you mentioned that it was important to you to write strong female characters. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it was I, I I don't know if I ever like really thought of it as like a strong female character. It was more to me it was like it felt like there was an opportunity because so much of what was happening on television, something like my favorite shows, even were male antiheroes. Hmm. And so it was, I felt like there was like an, an open lane there, which is like, you know, what about this, you know, like a lead female character who was not an antihero, but is hmm. somebody who was like trying to do the right thing. And, and, I, and I've always loved astronauts and, and have been um, really interested, interested in space and space exploration. And I think around the time I was reading a lot about astronauts too, and they're just these extraordinary people and uh, incredibly ambitious and driven and, and some of the smartest people in the room. And so the challenge for me was like, well, can I give somebody like that a, uh, an impossible problem to solve? Like, how do you take one of the smartest people in, you know, in the world and give them an impossible problem like this immaculate conception to solve? Mm. And what does that mean? And um, and then put them at the center for this big war between these three different emerg these three different species. And uh, and so it seemed like that was a, there was a real opportunity for that. And I I mean I just I do like writing female characters because I think sometimes just it's more interesting to like, it takes me out of myself hmm. a bit too when I'm writing. And, and, and I mean, it's, if you look at somebody like Woody Allen, like they're all sort of, they're all just kind of like um, avatars of him, like his lead <laughs> characters, you know? And I feel like yeah. I was doing that at the time. I feel like I had been short served, uh, not really servicing the female characters in my scripts when I was in my late 20s and early 30s. And part of that was just a course correction there too, of like hmm. realizing that I was, you know, I was writing the wife for the, the assistant or things like that too. And so part of it was also just a challenge. And I think it all kind of came together in a really interesting way and, and created a, a role that, that somebody like ultimately, a, a, you know, luckily for me, a movie star wanted to play, hmm. but, uh, but yeah, and, and then it just becomes something that I've just really been interested in, in since I, I, I tend to go through a thing when I'm brainstorming ideas that if it comes to me with one gender or another, I will always go through a period of just like flipping it to think about what that looks like and the other mm. in the inverse. And does it make it more interesting or less? Or what are the, what are the sort of cascading consequences of that? And um, so I still do that to this day. Hmm. Very cool. And what, why don't you just um, tell me a little bit about, I, I mean, I know it's all online and, and that kind of thing, but uh, that it was a very new thing at the time you won this contest um, the, the agents picked it up. Tell me about that whole story of, of how it got to Steven Spielberg and then got back to you. Yeah. I, I signed with my manager basically like a, a week after the, not even a full week after I placed second in the contest, the, the, mm -hmm. the person who was running the contest said, there's no prize. The prize of this really is we try to get it in the hands of people who can do something with it. So you'll probably mm -hmm. start getting some calls from managers and, and producers and things. And I got a call from this guy who, uh, named Brooklyn Weaver, who I'd been reading about for years and years and years. He'd been selling a ton of specs. I was very familiar with his name. And he was like, look, I think I could change your life with this. Like, I think this wow. is like, there are no, I remember him saying like, there's no guarantees. You know, the business is, is, is the business. It is what it is. But like, I think this is good enough that like, we can really, this could really go the distance. And so, um, it, he started sending it around and I feel like it really went viral in town. Like it's one of the things where it just it, it went to the agencies and went to a couple of studios and people were all just started talking about it. And I signed with WME and then the next day they said, 
let's send it to Steven Spielberg. It's like this weird wow. story, aliens, robots. Let's send it to the guy who does that better than anybody else. And uh, and then a week later, his, the the people at Amblin Television had read it, and they called me in. The people that uh, have are friends and family to this day, and they said they brought me in a week later and just started asking me a bunch of questions about it. Luckily, I had done this thing that I sort of just did instinctively, but I wrote myself a series overview document that was mm. kind of like six or seven pages maybe that I had really almost like fan fiction for my own pilot where I was just like, mm. here's where I think the story goes here. Are the journey of these characters it was very plot heavy, but, it, but at mm. least it was a revision for what it, where it could go. And so when they were asking me these questions, like I had answers for all these things, like, where do you see this character? Where do you see this character? Well, what I thought was this or what I thought could be cool is this, but like all this stuff is sort of new and I'm totally open to like talking about it. So it was a very collaborative meeting, and at the end of it, they said, well, we don't do anything unless Steven's really passionate about it, so let's send it to him and see what he thinks. And then a week later, we heard back that he really liked it and wanted to do it, like they were officially coming on board. And so wow. that, yeah, that was a sort of mind-blowing moment because there, even just the idea that he would you know, see my name on a piece of paper was just crazy to me. Mm -hmm. uh, again, like E.T., and this, I have all these like you know, pictures of me in Jurassic Park t-shirts from college and um, I have multiple ETs over to the, to the right of me here in the office. Yeah. Uh, just been, like, that's been my guy since I was a very little kid. And so that was sort of mind blowing to me. And then we were off to the races. We, the next step was find a showrunner and, mm -hmm. and they set up a number of meetings for me with this. Um, we ultimately went with this guy named Greg Walker, who became a great friend and great mentor through that whole process and was really a great showrunner. Um, to lead the chart and we took it out and sold it. I think we pitched it to like nine different places wow. and then. It was ordered straight to series at CBS. And then to, you know, back to your teaser there, that the day that it hit the trades, like the day after every, all the deals closed and everything was my 40th birthday. And so that 40th mm -hmm. birthday started with a call with the team uh, and Steven himself. That was, wow. um, that was basically like, you know, my first job in television, my first sale, all that stuff happened my 40th birthday. It was the, it was the 20 year overnight success kind of story. Almost, <laughs> to, almost to the day. Wow. And, and I mean, I, I grew up, the same time Star Wars was the first movie I remember. And um, I, I know that our generation has a special reverence for Steven Spielberg. Um, that must have been so surreal. It was incredibly surreal. There's there's another story that I, that I you know, I've, I've told a few people and, and you know, it may, it may be one of the people people don't know as much, but like a, the day after I, uh, the contest, the guy called me, you know, you're going to start getting calls from emails and managers and things like that. Um, my girlfriend and I went to Universal Studios because she was on mm -hmm. spring break. And so we would get off a ride and I would check my phone. I was like, oh, my God, I got another email from somebody wanting to set a meeting. And this is really cool. And then we took the tram tour and the tram went by Amblin Drive. Oh, and wow. I saw the sign and I was like, oh, my God, like that's where Steven Spielberg is. Like that's DreamWorks down there. That's, you know, that's uh, I think at the time I still been DreamWorks. So I was like, but that's you know, that's where Amblin is. And then like two weeks later, I was having a meeting in that office, like the, exactly like the tram. We had just passed by the exact thing I was pointing to. And uh, so that was that was pretty surreal, too. Very cool. So so talk about that experience. I mean, you're in the the writer's room for the first time. You're you're learning from the showrunner. And um, uh, sadly, it only went one season, but that must have been a very uh, educational two, yeah. season. Oh, it went two. Oh, yeah, two, I, I, yeah, sorry. I went two seasons. Sorry. Um, no worries. So so that that length of time must have been film school in a box for you. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Like shot out of a cannon directly onto a roller coaster with no brakes and no <laughs> no brakes <laughs> and gaps in the gaps in the track. Uh, it was yeah, I really approached it that way. I mm -hmm. thought I've never made a television show before. I would have absolutely no idea what I'm doing in terms of the day-to-day -day mechanics of that, being in a writer's room, breaking story and things. And so I, I really just treated it like this is a crash course in learning to make television mm -hmm. at the highest level. And so I just I, I tried to rely on everybody else as much as I could and tried to soak up as much as I could and learn from everybody, whether it was the writer's assistant, the PAs. I mean, a lot of them, had just they'd been working in the business longer than I had. So yeah. um, – a number of years longer than I had. So I really just tried to treat it like it, every day was an opportunity to learn something new. And, um, and I really feel like it did. And I, and I was got very lucky with Greg Walker because he kept me in his right hand the whole time. Like I was involved in every casting session, every hiring meeting, every edit, every mix all the way down to, you know, the final, um, 
mix downs on the stages and things like it was really start to finish like a crash course in that. And so mm. by the time I went to pitch my second show to pitch reverie and, and, and working on that and working with a new showrunner, and then I had a whole second season. I want to skip over the second season of that too, because I got to learn something really valuable, I think in the second season, which is mm-hmm. we got to the end of the first season, the ratings weren't great. It didn't feel, you know, the show didn't really catch on the way people wanted it to, mm-hmm. the way I wanted it to, for, for, certainly for sure. Greg had gotten to this point where he felt like he, he was a little more, I think, than he'd bargained for at that time. He really wanted to go to his own shows. And so we had new showrunners come in, uh, Liz Kruger and Craig Shapiro. And, and it was really this sense of, well, let's let the show evolve. Let's reboot it. And let's, you know, let's add new cast members and new energy to it. And how do we take the story and, and let it evolve organically? And that was a period, uh, a super crazy learning process too of, mm. You know, sometimes the show will tell you what it wants to be. Well, maybe the mm. show wants to be this other thing. And so let's infuse it with this new energy and these new characters. And, and adding new showrunners means this, you know, different change of voice. And my voice has to kind of merge with theirs. Mm. Uh, and so I learned a ton from those guys, too, from from Liz and Craig. And there and there were things that um, in that second season, things I'm really proud of and, and stuff that we did that was really fun. And, and I felt like a whole other opportunity – in getting to see my show like that first season, like, okay, like that, like, here's how you pivot away from that. And here's how you try something different when, you know, a lot of people feel like it's not necessarily working and, um, hmm. and having the courage to do that also having the humility to sit there and have a lot of people tell you what they think is wrong with your show, you know, and the things that you did, like that's, that was humbling and also like a little bit of a gauntlet. Um, but it was, but it was really helpful I and mean, it was really great by the end. And I think everybody that I worked with, you know, from Greg to those guys, to my showrunner for Reverie, to the showrunners I've worked for, you pick up tools and tricks and things that you learn mm. along the way. And um, and there are things with all those people I still think of every day when I'm doing the job now. Hmm. Very very cool. And uh, and so at the end uh, when it, when it was canceled, um, did you immediately go to develop the Mars series? Talk about that um, transition. Uh, what happened after that that series was done? Yeah, you know the Mars series was was already in development when I came on board, and they had mm-hmm. they had started a small room. It was after Excellent had been canceled, so it was I think it was late in that year, 2015, maybe around like Thanksgiving, almost right around this time uh, that year. And I got this a, a call about the show, like, is this something you'd be interested in? And and the way that they pitched it to me and the thing that really was exciting to me was it was going to be this mix of documentary and uh, and narrative fiction. So mm. like one half of the show would be these documentary pods about the people who are trying to get us to Mars. And then the other side would be this fiction story about the first settlers up there and the people who were mm. like the first crew living on Mars. And so that seemed like really exciting to be part of something like that that was – trying something new. I think mm. I was craving that too. And something a little more experimental. Um, so I went for this meeting with radical media and, um, one of the writers on it. And then one of the, uh, executive producers who was really in charge of the documentary pods and they brought me onto the team. So I, I think they'd, the room had already been going for a little bit mm. and they had a lot of like big, uh, great writers in the room and, and people who were very heavy space nerds. <laughs> and so I think that I came on and they brought this other lady, Karen Jansen on, um, to just add to the characters and to add character mm-hmm. stories and emotions and things like that too. Not that those writers weren't already doing that, mm-hmm. but I think that they had all the other stuff in space, all the, 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 the hard science of going to space. And, mm-hmm. uh, one of the guys, uh, Andre Romanis, I think he actually is a physicist. And so he oh, would huh. be, you know, calculating orbits and things like that. He's worked on a ton of the, you know, cosmos and, uh, Orville and things like that too. And so they had a lot of that stuff down, but I think they just needed more people to help with develop characters and stuff. And so mm. that's how I got into that and, um, got to spend a day in the writer's room with Ron Howard coming in to sit wow. with us and talk to us about making Apollo 13. And so that was uh, like, I, at that point I'd really only been in the business for like a couple of years at that point. And I was like, this is, it just kept getting crazier and crazier. <laughs> Steven Spielberg and Ron Howard in your first couple of years. That is pretty, yeah, pretty exactly. cool. First two shows. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, and so so then when that was done, did you uh, staff on The Strain after that? Yep, the final season on The Strain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I jumped onto that. Um, I, it was my first. You know, I, Mars was really like a staffing situation at, at mm-hmm. first, but because we were all so heavily involved in like getting the show up and running and really developing the characters and things, that we ended up, all of us, being having a developed by credit. Um, mm-hmm. But 
the stream was really like that was my first experience of coming in as you know on somebody else's staff and mm -hmm. the show had already been running for three seasons and so it was just like a crash course in that. And it was really important to me to do that after Extant 2 just because I wanted that experience and I wanted to know mm. what it feels like for other people in the room and um, and to be part of somebody else's team. To be the mm. – I always say this too, but for me it's really like an opportunity to be the kind of teammate that I would really want to have on my own team. Right. And somebody who doesn't get – stuck or spiral out or who doesn't you know cr crash into negativity and drag the room down but really somebody who comes in every day just to roll up their sleeves and go okay like how do we make this cool like what's mm. what's the great idea here? so i think that that uh, it was super fun and it was very challenging because like i said it already been going on for three years at that point mm. three seasons and so at, for the first few weeks i was pitching a lot of stuff that would be like oh we did that in season two or we did that and I had watched all those, but I had watched mm. them at such a like dead sprint in the right. run up to the room that it was all kind of like one blur. And so I, every day I drove home, I was like, today's the day I'm getting fired. And uh, and then eventually, like I started to settle in and, and felt like I kind of like found my footing. And then it was just so much fun. I got to go to uh, mm. Toronto and prep a couple of episodes in the middle of winter. Wow. And I just loved it. And I learned a ton. I learned a ton from uh, the showrunner from Carlton Q's. And there were two gentlemen in the room who were running the room for him, uh, David Weddle and Bradley Thompson, who had been on like Battlestar Galactica. They'd written some wow. of my favorite Battlestar episodes. Uh, and they were just super cool guys. And so, again, it's like one of those things where there are things that those – all three of those people talk about that I think about at least once or twice a week as I'm as I'm doing this job. Wow. Very, very cool. Yeah, I mean, add uh, Carlton Cues to the, to the – um... <laughs> The, the big name list for the first uh, few years of your It was pretty, career. like, that was a hard one to, like, I, I think I got, I psyched myself out a lot because I was such a huge Lost fan. Like, it was mm. so impactful to me. Yeah. But I think for the good first six weeks of it, I was just super nervous to be around. And I worked yeah. on uh, season two of Jack Ryan for him for a little bit, too, for a couple of months. And I don't think that ever really went away. Like, I think there was always part of me who was just, like, a little nervous and wanting yeah. to do a great job. And so you kind of, like, uh, it, 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 there's a, it was a lot of a lot of stress. But he's just a super funny guy. And, and, uh, and again, like, there are things that he – the way that he would approach a story or the way that he would articulate something is stuff that I think about and talk about all the time. Mm, very cool. So you, you were staffed on the strain, and then you developed and sold – Reverie. Talk about that experience. Yeah, it was it was really around the same time. In fact, I think I might have written Reverie before I actually started my job on the strain. Mm -hmm. I think I wrote Reverie in the maybe like a month after Mars ended. I had mm -hmm. written the um, written the pilot episode for the spec pilot for Reverie. And so while I was going, uh, we, we attached Amblin to it. So while I was in the room for um, the strain, we were also developing the pitch. And mm. then in, I think in the middle of, in the middle of the strain, yeah, it would have been, it would have been while we were working in the room, I was ducking out to do those pitches for reverie. Um, and then sold it actually got the call that they, I got the call that they were buying the pitch in the fall while I was still working mm. on the strain in the room. Oh, and wow. then I was in Toronto prepping those two episodes when I got the call that we were actually going to make the pilot. Wow. So I spent the first two months in uh, the first, I spent like the most of the month of January in Toronto prepping those episodes for the strain and then came back and immediately jumped into pre-production for the reverie pilot and then wow. back up to Vancouver. So I spent, I, I, I spent two out of the first three months that year in Canada uh, <laughs> making television, which was super awesome. And then going through that whole pilot gauntlet process of uh shooting it and then posting it and then you're you're testing and you're in competition with all these other people for talent and resources and money all those kinds of things and i think we were the last series ordered wow. right before the up i feel like we got the call maybe like friday before monday the upfronts are going to start uh and so, yeah, so I like it, it was it was pretty I mean, all, it's you know, it's always great when you get like your television show made. It's amazing. But yeah. also for me, I felt like it was a little bit of validation of having come in with Extent and, and having that 20 year trajectory and nobody knowing who I am and, and it mm. being somewhat of like a kind of crazy story that seemed just like this miracle shot moonshot. 
Mm. Um, the fact that I did it a second time was like, okay, well maybe actually I'll have a career mm. in this now, right? I've yeah. done it twice. So, uh, if I've done it twice, then it means I can do it a third time. Yeah. Very, very cool. And, uh, and then you were a consulting producer on, um, Jack Ryan. Was that, uh, have you ever had an overall deal or, or was that just the, the position that you took on that show? Never had an overall deal. That, um, part of that was just, I think I had just finished reverie we just finished production and i was Mm -hmm. had a time in between doing that and then i was going to houston to uh to put up a world premiere of a play that i'd written at a theater there called Spectre theater houston and so um i got a sort of call out of the blue i think they were in this process of starting pre-production on that season two of jack ryan and they just needed an extra hand in the room Mm -hmm. somebody to come in and help turn around documents and to help break story um because people were going to start peeling off to do their jobs. And mm-hmm. so because I had worked for Carlton on the previous show and, um, and his executive at the time, Lindsay Springer, who was at Amblin when I, who, when I first broke in, she was uh, at Amblin for Exit season mm-hmm. one. Um, I got the call they, and, and, wow. and got, got to come on board for the, for basically like just two months. And it's kind of funny cause I only worked on it for two months mm-hmm. and the room had been going for a long time. And then obviously like they went and shot everything after I was really just there to kind of like help, fill a gap for a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. but to this day, it's like the thing that most people will know, like people, when I'm a, if I say like, I'm a writer for film and TV and people were like, what have you written? Then I pretty, pretty much always start with Jack Ryan. Like, <laughs> I, I, well, I worked on Jack Ryan season two for a little bit and that's the thing people know. And then people from high school still every now and then will, will text me like, Oh my God, I saw your name in the credits for Jack Ryan. Did you really work on that? So it's, so yeah. it's probably the thing that I had the least amount of input in and, uh, the least amount of time on, but the thing that most people wouldn't know, like a yeah, recognize. So, but it was awesome. I, I had a really great time on it. And it was one of those shows that's like, um, when I got the job, I had to binge the whole first season and I was like, Oh, this is absolutely amazing. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it was the first thing I'd seen. It was like, Oh, it's doing the thing that the scope of movies, but also doing the thing that television does best, which is spending time with these characters. And so, mm-hmm. um, so I loved it. I had, I had a great experience on it. Very, very cool. Well, catch me up to the present. So that was uh, 2019-ish that you were on, Jack Ryan? 2018. 18. So so between then and now, uh, what have you been up to? I had a few years of development on the streaming Mm -hmm. side. I sold a pitch um, to Apple in late 2018 for uh, an adaptation of Barbarella that I spent a lot of time on, about a year. I let me a little over a year, year and a few months. Um, on, and then I was also working on a show for Netflix for a bit, for about a year and some change, um, called Firekeeper's Daughter. I was adapting that, mm-hmm. uh, co-adapting this book with a Native American screenwriter from Minnesota named Winona Wilms. And, um, and had the parting of the ways last November. So, was, so really those two jobs lasted a lot, um, of those, of that period of time. Um, but, but they ultimately decided to go in a different direction with the showrunner and, and somebody in charge. So like, uh, for, I think that, I, you know, the book came out, it was a, it was a YA bestseller mm-hmm. and it's not like the YA genre is not really like my wheelhouse. Exactly. So, so unfortunately like that job ended, but hopefully the, hopefully the series is living on and you'll get to see it at some point. Cause it's, it's just an amazing story. Um, but yeah, and then this year it's just been like a ton of pitching and development and, um, pitching on the feature side and, and really trying to get that going. I think I got very lucky when I broke in that I had a lot mm. of opportunities in television. Um, but I still really love movies and I want, I've yeah. still have yet to have the opportunity to write a movie for somebody. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm up to this year is, um, I wrote a feature spec, we attached a producer to it. We're out to some directors right now, and so that's hopefully the next the next stage is being part of those conversations. Actually, write a movie for somebody at some point. Very very cool. Right, we're going to take a quick sponsor break, and then we'll be back to talk about tips and advice. Drivingfootage.com provides 360 degree driving plates for film and TV. Over 14,000 clips are available for locations all around Southern California, with over a hundred new cities from the U.S. and Canada coming in 2023. A fully equipped camera car with height adjustable rig is available for custom shoots. Visit drivingfootage.com for details. AVgearguy.com uses state-of-the-art technology to bring new life to old films and videos, like the Lost Betty White series, Pet Set, which they recently restored for its 50th anniversary. 
they can apply the same technology to your documentary, film and video archive, and family videos. Visit avgearguy.com for details. Full disclosure, I do own both of these companies. By supporting them, you help me bring new in-person videos to you. And we're back. Um, so tell me about your writing habit. I mean, you have had a couple of series um, uh, go from pilot to series and uh, including to a second season. Um, uh, wh what do you do when you're off um, a series to develop a new project? Where do you go for ideas? How does that develop into um, a script? You know, my process is pretty messy. It's kind of like almost whatever works. It's just, uh, do you start with a character? Do you, do you, um, where, where do you, where do you go? It, I generally, I mean, my, I would say that my sort of normal route is really starting with a concept or starting with an idea of something, something that I'm interested in exploring. So basically like for, for reverie is, uh, I was playing with virtual reality. I bought a Google cardboard cause I'd never, I'd never actually used any kind of VR thing before. So I bought the absolute cheapest kind that I could mm -hmm. and started playing around with it. And that led to the idea for, Oh, well there's this company that creates a fully immersive virtual reality world. And it's so good that people are getting stuck in it. And so now they have to find somebody to go in and rescue them and bring them out. And really that led, started with the concept that led to the character really is thinking about who that is. Um, I mean, I think the, the, over this past year, I think it's been more like starting from the character side. And then uh, the latest thing that I'm working on, that I'm, I'm pitching, that I had a pitch for this morning, really started from an environment. It started from a location that I was reading about that was really interesting and the more I dug into it, I started learning about some of the people who are involved and some of the people who are kind of passing through this environment. And um, that led to some characters and really the character stories just kind of developed organically from there. So really kind of just sort of all the above. I mean, I, I'm one of those people, I tend to take in a lot of information and I'm reading a ton of things and I'm watching a ton of things and I'm always writing. I have a, a daily practice of writing in my journal, mm -hmm. mostly in the morning. Um, which I think is a lot of like churning through my subconscious and figuring out what's what's rattling around in there. And then eventually, like I'm one of those big, big proponent of that whole idea that creativity is just connecting things. And so mm. for me, what I find is I'm taking in a lot of those ideas and input and stuff. And then at some point, two things will like there will be a line appear between the two of those things. Hmm. Like, like with reverie, the virtual reality thing, but I was also reading a book about hostage negotiators. And so it was kind of like, Oh, well, a hostage negotiator will be the perfect person for this job because they're trained to make empathetic connections with people and, um, they work in high stakes scenarios. And so that would be the cool thing for that. So, so yeah, I mean, it really is, I, I kind of feel like these ideas, they could just come from all over the place. And it really hmm. is like that. It's a, a process of, asking questions and interrogating them and really drilling down onto the things that are worth spending a lot of time on and ultimately deciding in success. If I actually like write this and sell it and it goes and then we make a series, but this could be the next two or three years of my life. And mm. so, um, what's the thing that I'm really passionate about? And I think I'll still be passionate about in two or three years. Yeah. And, and what, what role does your, your representation play? I mean, at what point would you pitch an idea to your management? Um, and, uh, and what does that look like? I mean, it, it works both ways. So they'll send me stuff too. So I get things from both my managers and my agents, incoming submissions from people who have intellectual property that they're looking for somebody to develop mm -hmm. and adapt for, for movies or television. So I'll get those sort of incoming submissions and it's a process of just like, taking a look at it, do I see a, a personal angle to it? Mm -hmm. Do I do I see a path forward? Is there something about it that I feel like is just sparks creatively? And mm -hmm. then um, we'll have those conversations with them. For me, like, so, so last year in 2021, I spent the early part of the year just com coming up with all these ideas. And I put together like a little mini development slate for my mm -hmm. agents. And I sent it to them and said, look, here are the three TV ideas that I have at the moment. And here's some short pages on them and here are a couple of movie ideas. And so then we had a meeting and we just went through them. We're like, okay, well let's start here with this one and let's set up some meetings with producers to talk about it. Um, and then this year, it this year was a little, I didn't send them like a whole slate of those kind of things, but I had a couple really strong things that, that really strong pitches that just showed up like, okay, here's, here's the five page concept document for mm -hmm. this. And, uh, 
And so that will go have a little bit of back and forth, a little bit of conversation about it. And again, figuring out who were the prime targets for this and mm. who should we start talking to first about it. And so that's, that's really how it works. And they're, I mean, they're graded it. In fact, like during the agency split, during the whole like, you know, WGA um, agency, I really miss that because I feel mm. like I, because I have my head down and I'm working and developing these ideas, I don't read a ton of deadline. I don't. And, and, and even if I did, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of projects out there that I would mm. never know about things in development at varying stages. And so sometimes when I go to them with an idea, it's like, ah, it's kind of similar to this other thing. It's about ready to go here. Um, you know, we can always send it out. We can always set these meetings for you, but just know that that's like, that's already pretty far down the line. And you may want to think about like, is there another angle on or something? And so I really miss that input from mm. them in that period of time. Um, and just their general, like, you know, guidance and strategy. Cause I, I feel like that's a whole part of my brain that I probably should be better at, but I'm really trying to focus on like the creative side and just coming up with the best ideas possible and really like devoting as much time to the writing as I can. Hmm. Very, very cool. Um, I, I did want to ask a very, very odd coincidence, a very, very small world. Um, we were both in the Buffy quarantine musical. Um, talk about that experience for you. How, what, what led you to that project and, uh, and what that was like for you. Yeah, I think I met Emily Blake. Well, I remember I, I knew of Emily for a long time because of the done deal pro website. And so I think mm -hmm. I heard, that was when I first heard her name, but I was a guest on the podcast that she did with, with two of her friends, um, with Lauren and Maggie. And so I, I think ever since then, we've just been friends on social media. And then I saw that she was working on it and looking for people to, to jump in and take over a role. And it was during quarantine. It was when everybody was pretty locked down. And I was like, oh, well, that'll be kind of fun. Like I haven't done a musical. I, I haven't indulged that sort of musical theater side in a long yeah. time. And, um, and so it just seemed like something fun and creative to do. And, and so that's kind of how I got involved. And I like, I, I, recorded my song and also like obviously like being a musical theater fan and, and, and having a musical theater background. I love that episode anyway. And so it was mm. like one of those things that I uh, was very familiar with. And so, yeah, it was super fun. It was really a fun, creative thing to see coming together. And I was so shocked when you sent me that message today that you were yeah. involved from the beginning and, and the, like the editing and all that stuff too. Yeah. 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 Just a crazy, crazy coincidence. Yeah. I, I don't even remember how I got on that project. I, I think, it had been a Craigslist post where um, I think Emily lost her editor for some reason, and she was looking for an editor, and uh, and so I I answered that, and then uh, it, the, just the topic came up that they were still looking for some people to do some of the parts, so I offered to do that that too, but yeah, it was just a were hoot. You, did um, you sing mm -hmm. that too? Like were you? Yeah, I, I was one of the Giles. You you were a Giles, and yeah. I, I was one of the other Giles. <laughs> You actually kind of look a lot more like the Giles than I did. Uh, did you? Uh, did, were you a singer before this? Like, did you had like? Oh yeah, I, mean, I, I, I had a rock band for for years, um, as a, like awesome. in an early college. Where was this? Up in Toronto. Awesome. And then, what kind of music were you playing? Uh, I played bass guitar, and uh, we're sort of at the time they called it um, alternative, but it w I don't even know if it would be alternative now. Just really poppy kind of stuff. Were you kind of like around the time? I, I mean, I imagine you and I are like somewhat in the ballpark, Adrian's wise, but like the bare naked ladies there. Were you kind of like? I, I actually went to school them? with um, my my very first short film was a documentary on the bare naked ladies before they got their first record deal, um, because the very first person I met in college was the uh, guitarist from that band, um, and so we struck up a, a friendship. Um, and uh, that's crazy yeah it was right right around that time well I'm, i mean i've been fans of those guys for such a long time and now what's kind of mm -hmm. funny is and i don't know if it's just like as you're getting older that, that you, you the things that you get interested in and and mm -hmm. every kind of drifts the same person. but like but ed is a huge pinball guy yeah and like i'm a huge pinball fan too so a lot of the people i watch like the streamers and people like he'll always pop up on on these pinball videos and things too it's so funny yeah. But um, but I knew he was like living in Toronto, and I f assumed that like they're you know they're alternative. So you would like I imagine you would run in the same circles. So that's so mm -hmm. that's so funny that you did cross paths with him. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, yeah. So anyway, back to uh, TV. Um, I know. Yeah, you mentioned this a little bit, but um, it can seem 
two people in the industry that you were an overnight success, but it was anything but. Um, uh, talk about, um, well, I, I mean, I guess we've kind of covered that question, but uh, what were the skills that you you learned before 40 in all your independent filmmaking and, and plays and that kind of thing that you feel were most helpful in your TV writing career? Yeah, I think the... Like I said, I think that so much of it is just putting on a show. Mm-hmm. And I think that if you have a, if you start to develop that muscle where I was doing a lot of summer stock, I was sort of directing a lot of summer stock, directing kids shows, working with kids, putting on my own things, independent, um, doing things at like fringe festivals and stuff like that in New York, that you just gradually start to develop that muscle of learning to communicate your ideas to other people. In a way that's that hopefully it, it is, and I, and I also think I learned this too along the way, which really helped when I when I finally broke in, which is is finding great people and then also just getting out of their way hmm. and trusting them to do their work. And I found that in a lot of those situations, like saying like in a very small um, you know theater company where there's not a lot of resources, like I kind of had to do a lot of different stuff. And you're, mm-hmm. it's not even like you want to be a micromanager, but you're just kind of sort of all hands on deck. Yeah. And I learned that that was always like not conducive to me doing my best work then mm-hmm. too, because I was so s- scattered. And so I found that like, well, one of the things like about sh- show running is that you are in charge of all those areas like it all the, the the not just the day-to-day creative stuff but also the day-to-day administrative stuff of running the show like it all has to come through you but i feel like the people who are the micromanagers who are trying to do everybody's job for them then mm. i feel like it one demoralizes people and also takes away their you know it doesn't give them their own a creative investment in the show and i think people people will start to like check out a little bit um if that if that happens um, but it also sets you up for not doing your best work as well. Cause if you're mm. sort of micromanaging everybody else and you lose sight of the big picture, if you're always looking at the next, you know, tiny patch of grass in front of you. And so I feel like I learned those things. It just, they were just part of my like general outlook on producing and creating in general by the time I, I broke in. And mm. so I think that that's kind of one of the things I, um, that I, that I really that I I feel like I learned and carried forward, and so that I feel like having not exactly had the chance to run my own show really fully through production yet, but having been such a big part of me a creator of it, that I could be a a sort of positive energy and hopefully that not you know like leading by example in a way that's that's healthy and not contributing to like a toxic environment, which happens so often out here. We've heard all these stories over the past few years. So, um, so I think, that, I mean, look, first and foremost, it's just like learning to be a good human being and respectful of other people in very difficult circumstances. Mm. And that, that I think is like, um, a big part of it. And I kind of want to tell you too, about even in talking to actors and working with actors and working with kids, all those skills, very practical skills, I think were, were super helpful when I finally broke in. Um, and then, you know, collaboration and, and compromise. When you're putting together a fringe festival show for the New York Fringe and you have like eight dollars and you have a bunch of people and you have 15 minutes to set it up and 15 minutes to tear it down. Like you're really all in it together and you got to be there for the mission of, of doing it. nobody's getting rich off of it. Nobody's getting mm-hmm. famous off of it, um, at least in our cases. And so it really has to be a, about the making of the thing. And that has mm-hmm. to be fun and inspiring for everybody involved. And so I really, that's something I try to bring to every, every project now too. And just, um, yeah, like I just want people to have a great time and have a great experience afterwards. Mm. Literally life's too short otherwise. Mm -hmm. And, and do you, do you think that, um, filmmaking is a good path for future TV writers? Like, like if, if you had had the chance to, to go back, would you have gone to LA earlier or would, or do you think that that filmmaking was an important part of your journey getting there? I think it certainly was an important part of my journey getting there. I I think that the things that I learned about myself and just having to get up when like, and, and go to a job to pay off the processing fees or to pay for the shipping of the film and really like being so dedicated to it and making those drives to Indiana and, and also forging those friendships and the collaborations and the, and the relationships with 
those people who all became like family, mm. um, it was such a big part of it. And it's really like ultimately at the end of the day, it, it worked. Like I, I, I wouldn't go back and change anything because I actually got where I wanted to be. Like I actually broke in. I feel like undoing any one of those bricks might take me somewhere else. Um, yeah. But I do feel like the filmmaking part of it was, was super helpful. And I think that there is something to writing, shooting, editing, even if it's just like the smallest thing on your phone that mm. you will learn something valuable from it. Like I'm starting to do that now. Like I started pulling out into this, I'm, I'm in my new office now and I started pulling out my GoPros and things like that and charging them up and, and just really like having this need to um, start to shoot some things and piece some things together and, and get back and, and digging around in final cut again and, and mm-hmm. making stuff for myself because I feel like that stuff has atrophied a little bit and I want to get better at it. I was never a great director. I was like, was like, in fact, I was like a terrible director, uh, other than working with actors and things that I, that part I was pretty good at. Um, but I want to be better at it. And I feel like anything you can do that like hones your skills that is educational for you, it will all pay off in the end. And, you know, you may not make a short that gets in the Sundance and gets you signed and sells for, you know, a million dollars and leads to a, a multi-picture deal. But you will learn something about yourself and you will learn something about the act of creation mm. that will be beneficial to you going forward. Very cool. And what, what would your advice be to somebody who has a pilot that they really want to make into a series? They don't want it to be just a sample. They really want it to be a series. Uh, do you mean like that they want to shoot themselves and make the series or they want? Or that they, they, want, that they want to sell. Um, like, they, like your experience where you wrote the pilot and it got made. What, what do you think people could do to, to, um, to be successful at that? Wow. That's a huge question. I'm mm-hmm. not sure because it seems like everything is changing so much right now. Mm-hmm. And it feels like the things that, I, I mean, it's almost like any example I could give, there will be an example contradictory of something that mm-hmm. worked and something that didn't, right? Yeah. Um, because there are certain things that just defy explanation or certain things. I mean, I think the, the, the thing right now, I would say if you're a writer um, who is, it, it seems like the things that are really working and the things that are breaking through the noise right now are just really like, are things that have a big conceptual hook. Mm-hmm. I think one of my favorite shows of the year was Yellow Jackets. And yeah. Yellow Jackets had such an amazing conceptual hook that was, it's it's this high school soccer team, girls soccer team. They crash in the wilderness and it devolves into like a crazy Lord of the Flies, you know, pseudo cannibalist thing. And then the other part of the show is 20 years later, they you know they survived. They were rescued. The people who who survived are now dealing with the consequences and ramifications of that. I feel like if I was an executive and I was sitting in the room and heard that, I would be like, well, let's order that now. Like I would just start <laughs> throwing my credit cards at them to make that show. Like let's yeah. get on that immediately because that is such a cool conceptual hook. And so it feels like I mean it's one of the things that people are talking about. There are a lot of the buzzwords of like you know it has to be undeniable. A couple I don't know maybe a month or two ago. I had a meeting with somebody at the studio and they were, used the term combustible. And so combustible. I tend to think about those terms too of like, what is the thing that's going to make your pilot script combustible? Like the thing that's going to attract these elements and have it catch fire. Mm. Um, is it a big conceptual hook? Are there roles that movie stars would want to play? Is it an interesting world that we've never seen before? Is, is it something familiar, but you're showing it to us in a whole new way? I feel like all those things add to like the combustibility of, mm. of an idea that's going to really make somebody interested in it. Um, but right now it seems like so strange. There are so many people, I've heard so many stories about people taking out shows and, and taking out shows with A-list talent and then just not selling things that you would mm. think three, four years ago would be a sure bet. Yeah. Uh, that, that it's not, it's, that that world really doesn't exist right now. And so, yeah, I mean, I think look, only you can't, you, you never really can game the system. You have to mm-hmm. write the thing that you really want to watch and the thing that you're really passionate about and the thing that, that is the most sort of personal and makes sense to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but if that thing does have a big conceptual hook and a movie star role, at least one, then you're, you're already like further down, further down mm-hmm. the field. Well, honestly, that's, that's very insightful and very helpful. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, any any other thoughts? Any, anything else that you'd like to talk about? No, I mean, I, you mentioned one thing at the very beginning, and I think I'll say two things. Mm-hmm. The it, it does seem impossible. 
and if you know there are if there are people out there who are watching this who are weighed down or discouraged by the impossibility of the task, I would just say that like it does happen. Like I, I was that one in a million shot. Sometimes people are like, do you ever feel bad about giving other writers hope? And I'm like, <laughs> no, because like the thing is it does happen. Like it did happen to me. And mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm, I'm not like a super smart guy or any more driven or creative than the next person. Um, I just stuck with it long enough until I created something that people were interested in. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, um, and I had the, I had a luck, I had a stroke of luck and that there were a number of people who, who, um, who responded to it. And so I think that that creating those opportunities, just like continuing to write new material and seeking ways to get it out there will maximize your chances. It does take a little bit of luck, but it does happen. And the other thing I would say, like at the panel where we met um, in 2012, shortly after I moved out here, I went to WonderCon in Anaheim Mm -hmm. and I watched a panel on TV writing. And one of the people on that panel was Keto Shimitsu. Oh yeah. Who at that time, she was. I think I can't remember what exactly she was riding on at the time, but the, I the cape was maybe the panel with her. It might have been the cape, yeah. Yeah. And she, um, she was just very insightful and and inspiring and not discouraging at all about it. And I remember sitting in the audience and watching that panel, and I was writing my own stuff and trying to break in at the time, and um, and I just kept going. And a year later, I broke in. And then earlier this summer at the at Comic Con where we met, like I was on a panel with her, sitting side by yeah. side with her. And one of the things I said at the end of that is that like it does happen. And so like yeah. if you're really driven to do it and you really want to do it, uh, keep at it. There is a chance. Like there is there is hope. Hmm. Awesome. Awesome stuff. I think I can't think of a better way to end, um, this, this time, uh, just wrapping up, uh, so, social network handles on Twitter, you're Mickey Fisher 73. Yep. Mickey Fisher 73. And also I think, I mean, for as long as I'm on Twitter, hopefully, I mean, for as long as it's around at least, um, pinned to the top there, I also write a newsletter. It's totally mm-hmm. free. And the, uh, the sign in link is there too. So I, it's it's somewhat weekly, or you know, I'll take a week off or two weeks off every now and then. But it's it's really is an ongoing process journal about the stuff that I'm mm-hmm. doing and the things I'm figuring out along the way. So if people want to check that out, that would be great too. Very very cool. Well, Mickey, I really appreciate you taking the time. And also, uh, I, I mentioned this to um, uh, to a few people. I mean, Spiro obviously does as amazing work in in all these panels but just taking the time to be on that panel you don't know how much that helps people and and there's going to be somebody in the room um from the panel that you did who eight ten years from now is going to be having that same experience that you had with with keto um and so thank you for doing that thank you for the newsletter thank you for all that you're doing to help um, other people to follow in your footsteps Thank you for having me. And by the way, I'm counting on that person to break in so they can give me a job in eight years. So, yeah. <laughs> but thanks Very for having cool. me. I really I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks, Mickey. That's it for the episode. You can find us on the web at tvwriterpodcast.com or at scriptmag.com. The video version of this podcast is available at iTunes, Podbean, or YouTube. The audio-only version is available at iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, or Pandora. You can find me on Instagram at at TV Writer Podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Gray Jones is my handle. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.